Lord, we are just thankful as we continue in thy presence for thy wonderful presence. We're thankful for the blessing of remembering you at your table. Lord, we're thankful that, Lord, you have provided such a great salvation that we can come and really put you in remembrance. We do glorify you, Lord. And, Lord, we're thankful, too, that you've given us your word. And as we come to your word, we find ourselves in a place of great dependence. But again, we're thankful you've made every provision for this time. You've made a provision through your Holy Spirit for speaking and for hearing. And Lord, we are those that just don't want to be the hearers of your word, but really allow your word to be working in our lives, that we would be those that are doers of your word, responding in life, Lord, not just gaining knowledge about you, but really having encounters with you, Lord, every day. We commit this time into your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in the times I've been sharing, we've been just considering the days that we're living in. Because as we look around, uh, sometimes we think, how much worse can it get? And then all of a sudden, it gets just a little worse or worser for us. Us non-English majors, that's worser. <laughs> but uh, we just think uh, in these times of weakness and declension, you know, how do we keep going on? How do we stay encouraged? And we're thankful for the, the Lord, how he encourages us in 1 Corinthians. It says the, the history of the nation of Israel, as we see it back in the Old Testament, is a great encouragement to us in these days. And it's there and many reasons for it, but one of the reasons is that it's there for us to learn some lessons. It's there as we look back and reflect upon the, the history of Israel, we can be those that are encouraged and strengthened to continue pressing on. We know that as we, in a general way, as you look back at the overall history of Israel, that it reached its zenith under the time of David and Solomon. But then because of the sins of Solomon, a time of declension and division came in. It was divided into that northern and southern kingdom, or Israel and Judah. We know that in Israel there was really never any great reviving. They just continued to go further and further away from the Lord, pursuing their own interests, pursuing the idols and the religions and things of this world. We know in Judah at times there were ones that the Lord, as he looked down, he found a man after his heart, and he raised him up. And just as in those days, the Lord is doing the same thing today. He's looking for ones after his heart. And so we've been looking back at the kings and trying to look at the ones that the Lord was able to use that they could be an encouragement to us. Because just as in the Old Testament, uh, there's this verse in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, where it says, The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is toward his or whose heart is completely his. That's what God's looking for today. God is simply looking for a people whose heart is completely his. It doesn't get complicated. He's not looking for us to do this and do that and perform this task and perform this task. He's looking for ones whose heart are completely his. And when he finds those people, just as he reacted in the times of Israel, we see throughout church history, he's reacted today. He's reacted throughout history. Now there's an ebb and flow. At times, once there's a reviving, and then there's a going back. And we, actually, that's probably reflective of most of our lives, if we're honest. Most, most of our Christian lives, there's an ebb and a flow. We get we're really encouraged by the Lord and we, we take some steps forward and then we can get a little confident in ourselves and not as reliant upon him as we were at one time and we start falling back. But then God in his great love, he, through circumstances or somebody close to us or whatever, he wakes us up. He sends that call to return to him. And as we return to him, he again revives us and continues to recover all that's of his and encourages us to go on. So this is why we're looking at this matter of the kings. Because as we're living in times of declension, many of these kings, they were living in times of declension. And their heart was set on the Lord and the Lord used them. 
And we desire that the Lord would use us in this day and time. The last king we looked at was Jotham. And he had just a wonderful, it was a brief testimony about him in 2 Chronicles 27. It says, he became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. He was just had his heart completely toward the Lord. He ordered his ways and walked in the ways of the Lord. But tragically after him, his son Ahaz was born. And Ahaz is one of the most wicked kings there was in Israel. Uh, sometime we can, we think if we have good good parents, the kids will automatically turn out well. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's just, we're going to see in a second how it can work the other way too. You know, we have Jotham was a good king and Ahaz ends up being wicked. He actually closed the door to the house of God. And it says within Jotham's life, I mean within Ahaz's life that the more things going wrong, the more he turned his heart away from the Lord. The Lord was pressing him in to get his attention, but he kept turning further and further away. But out of Ahaz came a Hezekiah. Hezekiah, in most Jewish traditions, uh, is rated as kind of, uh, there were three great kings. You have David, Solomon, and Hezekiah. He was, a, he was a great king. And we're very thankful as we look at him today, we look to the Holy Spirit to teach us some lessons we can learn from about Hezekiah. So turn to 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles 29, we'll read the first four verses as it introduces us to, to Hezekiah. And it says, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old. That's encouraging for a young person. He became king when he was 25 years old. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. But we see Hezekiah, how out of the midst of the decay and the declension and all that his father Ahaz had brought in, God found a man after his own heart. That was the testimony of David. David had that heart for the Lord. We find a Hezekiah. Now, we don't know for sure, but uh, many have uh, just wondered if the influence within Hezekiah's life was his mother. Uh, it looks like she is from the priestly family. And this should be a great encouragement to, to sisters in this day and time, how in the midst of the declension and all that we're living in, and the way that even motherhood is being put down in this day, in the midst of all that ruin, utter ruin, there was one who God could use, this dear one Abijah, to raise up Hezekiah and maybe put the word of God in his heart. Uh, it's a precious gift that each mother has. As a child is entrusted into you, I think, um, to me, motherhood... <laughs> is probably the greatest ministry, the greatest gift, the greatest stewardship that ones have upon this earth. And would the world not rob us as his people of the preciousness of that stewardship? We not look down upon it. It's very precious. But that's, that's another time. <laughs> but we see how Hezekiah, he reigned 29 years and through each of these kings, we've seen the influence that prophets have also. During the time of Hezekiah, the, the two major prophets there influenced his life were Isaiah and Micah. And they had a tremendous impact upon his life. And it's interesting how as it talks about Hezekiah, it says that he did right according to his father David. He goes, now we know chronologically David wasn't his father. But spiritually, David was his father because he goes back to the very foundation of the kingdom. He goes back to the beginning. David was that standard. David was the one. He, Hezekiah just didn't want to go back to, oh, it was good under Jotham. Maybe we can go back there. Oh, maybe it was pretty good under Jehoshaphat. Maybe we could go back there. Oh, it was good under Asa. Maybe we could go back there. He went all the way back to David, this one after God's own heart. 
And he said, this, is, this was his standard. Because David is the standard who God measured everybody, all the kings up to. David was that one. And it begs the question within our heart, who is the standard in our life? And who is the standard? In our days of declension, who is that standard? And we know that it's Christ. You know, we have a tendency at times we can think, oh, let's just go back uh, a few years. Maybe things were a little better then. Let's go back to this point in our life. It was better. God wants us to go all the way back, all the way back to the beginning, that having our foundation in simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. He's the one. We don't want to go back to when we thought they were better. We want to go back to what Christ has within his heart. And we want him to be our standard. We, this week I was, I was looking uh, in the Gospel of Luke. There's that story of the Pharisee and the publican who both go into the house of the Lord. And to me it shows us who's the standard in their lives. As that Pharisee goes into the house of the Lord, he says, oh Lord, look how good. Look at all I've done for you. I'm glad I'm not like that one. But that this, the Pharisee, his standard was just other people in his works. But that's, that sinner, that publican went in and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. The Lord was his standard. He knew his place. And would we not be ones that think, oh Lord, I thank you I'm not like that brother. We don't have other brethren as our standard. Lord, I thank you I'm not like that. I thank you I'm not like that. No, the Lord is our standard. And as an assembly... May we never think, we say, oh, Lord, we thank you that we're not like those other assemblies. That's just pride reeking out. We're all sinners saved by grace. It's all by his, his mercy that we're here. He's our standard. That's who we met. And whenever we compare ourselves to him, we fall at our feet. If we see the beauty and the glory of our standard, it will also bring out a greater praise and glory during our time of the Lord's table because we'll see the greatness of what he's done. And as we touch in Ephesians, we'll see the riches of all that we've been brought into. Let's not unconsciously set other standards in our life, but the Lord is our standard, and that's what we're pursuing. Now, when Hezekiah became king, there was two things that he did immediately. Uh, kind of simultaneously they were going on. He starts removing all of the idols uh, from the land and starts cleansing it. And he also starts restoring the house of God. And these two things actually go together because it's no good to just take evil out if there's nothing good to come in. Yeah, we take evil out and we remove the evil from our lives, but then we bring the Lord into the situation. And it's no, no, it doesn't really have a great impact if we just try to bring the Lord into a situation where we haven't cleansed and consecrated ourselves and cleansed the vessels that would be fit for his use. So these two matters, these, these two issues go hand in hand. The cleansing and the purifying, the consecrating of ourselves and the bringing in of his life. And it's kind of like, uh, it reminds me of the prophet Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah's ministry was to pluck up and to break down, to destroy, but then he was also to build up and plant. There was that taking out, but then there was also that building up and that planting. And we see this within Hezekiah's life. Now on the negative side, as we said, he, he started cleansing the land. And most of the good kings, they did. They removed all the idols and they did all of these things. There was one unique thing that Hezekiah did. Uh, and if you look, it was back in 2 Kings chapter 18. There was this bronze serpent that Moses had used. Remember the story back in Numbers 21 where the people were murmuring against the Lord. And the Lord, out of his judgment, he sent serpents among the people. And as, he, as the serpent would bite the different people and bring judgment in. But then the Lord told Moses to raise up this bronze serpent. And anyone who looked to that serpent would be healed, would be saved. And praise God, there were ones that, that turned to that serpent. And after that, we don't know what happened to that serpent. You never hear any more about this bronze serpent until you get over into 2 Kings. And at some point in Israel's history, and we don't know when, 
they started, they've turned that into an idol. And they started burning incense to it. Uh, again, we don't know when it was, but uh, they start, what they were doing was this had been, this piece of bronze had been used by the Lord in a mighty way. And it was a testimony unto our Lord Jesus. As you look off unto him, we're saved. It was a picture of Christ and salvation. So it was used in a marvelous way. But was there any intrinsic spiritual value in that piece of bronze? It was just a piece of bronze metal. The value in it was Christ, the life of the Lord, the power of him and how he was using it. There was no spiritual value in it. And they just, they had turned it into an idol and a superstition. And Hezekiah utterly destroys it. Well, it begs the question within our heart, how about us? Do we have these types of idols in our lives? You know, do we have, an, do we have objects? Do we have even a teaching that we place some spiritual value in it in and of itself? Do we have times that we hold certain places or events or, or conferences and feel like, oh, this is what we need again to truly experience the Lord? We can unconsciously create these so-called religious idols and have them impact within our lives. But Yes, at one time, God used them in a mighty way. And God can continue. But are we really, are we putting a value in them that God has never intended? You know, it's, look at this building. You know, I thank the Lord how he's provided for this building. And we're thankful for that. And we're called to be stewards. And we should care for this building. But is there any intrinsic religious value in this building? Absolutely not. You know, there's not. You know, but we can subtly think, oh, I've got to get to that building to do this or that. And we limit God the way he works, and we can create these idols. Many, many believers wear crosses around their necks. Now, I thank the Lord. We, can, we should respect the cross. We should value it. And it can be a testimony. But are we putting a religious value in that piece of metal? Now, we need to have the Lord search our hearts because we can unconsciously start putting, adding a spiritual value to something that God has used in our lives, and we actually end up limiting the Lord in a wonderful way. You know, one of the things that we're greatly indebted to uh, within this assembly is the conference. Okay, and we're very thankful for that conference, but, you know, one of the things I... I we have to guard within our hearts is do we only think God can speak at the conference? Is we're praying for the conference to be coming and we're thankful he does speak. It's almost like, well, I've got two more months before God can speak. And will he speak then? He can speak to us today. He can speak anytime. Now, I'm as pro-conference as anybody. Don't miss anybody misinterpret that. <laughs> but we can put, we can subtly put Intrinsic spiritual values in inanimate things. Try to get the point that I'm making. We, we, we can put value in something that the God never intended. He wants to use these things in our lives. He uses events. He uses past experiences. And so often we can think, oh, if I can get back to that place, that little wooded grove on the side of the hill where I was and I had this experience with the Lord, there I can touch him again. Well, maybe you can, but you're not, we don't limit God. He can touch us here and now and meet us in wonderful ways. It's amazing how we have such a, the flesh can try to be so religious and substitute things for the life of Christ. And this is, uh, this is what Hezekiah saw. He saw that this thing that was one time used by God in a mighty way, people were putting a wrong value in it. So may, may we just really learn from that lesson. You know, as we see, as, as our Lord was upon earth, the earth, he, was, he made these wonderful testimonies. He said, as, as they looked around at all their religious heritage, he says, there's one greater than Jonah here. There's one greater than the temple here. 
There's one greater than Solomon here. There's one greater than all of your experiences. There's one greater than these religious places. Do we have that daily intimate relationship with him to know the greater one? This is what, this is what so many of the Jews were missing. They were looking back at very, and they were locked up in a religion and they'd lost the very life. And the Lord wants us to enter in to that, have, maintain that life in a fresh way and have that intimacy because that's what is so essential in times of declension. We get away from that life that he's called us to. So would the Lord really bring us and revive us in that? Now in the, in the positive side, we said Hezekiah, he starts to restore the house of God, the priesthood and the word. We saw back in uh, chapter 29, verses 3 and 4, how immediately, as soon as he becomes king, he starts this wonderful restoration process. This is, a, this is one whose heart was on fire for the Lord. This is one who's responding in first love. He had that love for the Lord. He had that love for his house. And he, he pressed on through and he had this desire. And praise God, he, he brings it quickly into restoration. It actually, it only took about 16 days. This place that had been utterly ruined and just, uh, much had been stripped of it. And as one set their hearts to it, it, it was amazing how wonderful and how quickly it was, was restored. And as you look at the end of verse, uh, chapter 29, verses 35, it's, it speaks of how this was restored and the worship was brought about. And it says, There were many burnt offerings with the fat of the peace offerings, with the libations for the offering, for the service of the house of the Lord was established again. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over what, had, what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about suddenly. Now, naturally, if we'd have looked upon Hezekiah's life when he first became king, and he said, I want to restore the house of God. I want to do this and that and bring the Lord glory back to this place. And he have his rightful place. We said, oh, that's a good idea, but it'll, look, all the damage that Ahaz has done, it'll take you a long time. It's a lot of effort. Praise God with the Lord, that day can be as a thousand years. I mean, when he found ones whose heart were in that right place, God moved quickly and mightily. So often we think in, in the days we're living in, in such declension, oh Lord, it's going to take, how can you ever recover a testimony for yourself in this day and time? We've fallen so far away. But when God finds those hearts that are towards him, he can move a, Immediately, right away. He has a different timetable than we have. And praise God for that. And this was a, it was a marvelous time of restoration. And there's one little phrase in this part of the worship that I, that I loved. And it was back up in verse uh, 27. And talked about how in, in chapter 29 it says, And Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offerings on the altar. And when the burnt offerings began... The song to the Lord also began with the trumpet, accompanied by the instruments of the, the song to the Lord. It just reminds us of what our brother shared as we opened uh, this morning. As we came and that we come into that presence and we see what he's done, and so that, we have that burnt offering. See Christ as our sacrifice. There's that song to the Lord that's being recovered, being lifted up. It's an interesting phrase. You don't see it uh, much, but it's just, this was a song to the Lord. It wasn't a song about them or anything. It was just that song to the Lord coming out. And we want to be those two that are offering up that song. And as David, as David, as Hezekiah continues, not only does he restore the temple, but then the Lord has put it upon his heart that they would celebrate the Passover. They wanted, he, he had it upon his heart. And so as you look in verse uh, in 2 Chronicles 30, it says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they would come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord of Israel. Oh, what a wonderful burden that this had put, the Lord had put upon his heart. Because this Passover, it was the very foundational work that the Lord had done. A testimony of bringing the people of God out of Egypt, bringing them into the land of his own possession, 
bringing them out of the world and how he was that deliverance. And just as David had this heart, Hezekiah has this heart. And it says that they, had, they end up, they, they celebrated in a way that hadn't been celebrated in over 300 years. It was, it was a marvelous celebration because in this we see how God has such a heart. But one of the things that touched me so much about Hezekiah here was Hezekiah really was a man after God's own heart because one after God's own heart has a heart for all of God's people. Hezekiah just wasn't burdened, concerned about those. Okay, oh, those of us in Jerusalem, let's celebrate the Passover. Those of us in Judah, let's celebrate the Passover. He says, no, I want all of God's people. I want all of Israel. To, I mean, he invited them all. And we, he, we see how he had such a heart because he sends the couriers, if you look, Later on in the chapter in verse 5, it says, He sent couriers throughout all of Israel and Beersheba, from Dan to Beersheba, you know, re representing the northern and the southern parts, that they would really come and really be able to see all that God had done. He, wasn't, he, was, he had his heart set on a testimony for all God's people. Because as we look, even at these, if we look at some of the particular verses, it says in verse 24, in 29, 24, And the priests slaughtered them, the animals, and purged the altar with their blood to atone for all Israel, not just Judah, for all Israel. For the king ordered the burnt offerings and the sin offering for all of Israel. Christ has made provision for all. We are God's people. And he, Hezekiah, we see this one who's reaching out to one and he's making this, this offering. And he sends these ones out throughout the kingdom to invite them, everybody, to come because at this point it wasn't until about the sixth year of Hezekiah's reign that the northern kingdom was taken into captivity by Assyria. So there was, they were still there. We actually see God's love to that northern kingdom as he reaches out and calls them back to himself one last time before judgment. Oh, that God is such an everlasting love. And he's calling them back to himself. And it's sad how many responded. If we look down in, in chapter 30, verse uh, 10, it says, So the couriers passed then from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Nessa as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mock them. You know, here they, they were reaching out. God's love was reaching out, but it was rejected. And they were Israel, many were rejecting and laughing in the scorn. But, praise God, nevertheless, some men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded. Oh, it's, it's wonderful how even though some rejected, they, they came back together. There was that, there was, if you count the number of tribes that get referenced in here, it's, it's probably about representatives from about five or six of the tribes of that northern kingdom came back. And they gathered together. And this also in this celebration of the Passover, you see one of the greatest acts of the grace of God. Even under a time of law, where they had all these ceremonial laws that they had to keep. If we look uh, in chapter 29, there were many who had come back and they really hadn't gone through all of the ceremonial uh, washings and cleansings and things that were required by the law. And Hezekiah uh, prays for them. Um, at the end of verse 18... It says, For Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. You know, they hadn't gone through all of the ceremonial laws, but they had a heart. They came back with a heart for the Lord. This is People talk about not seeing the grace of God in the Old Testament. This is a marvelous picture of the grace of God. His grace was greater than the law. 
And he, he, he intervened because he was, well, he's always looking for hearts. And these ones, they, their hearts were prepared. They had a heart. They had made a sacrifice in the midst of being mocked and scorned by others within their community. They made a choice to come from all of the different areas of Israel and to come and return and see what God had done. And they wanted to celebrate this Passover. Their hearts were prepared. And God came in and said, yes. You know, it's wonderful how there was this grand invitation that even though those in the northern kingdom of Israel had turned their back on the Lord, the Lord never turned his back on them. They were in a terrible place spiritually, but God continued to call unto them to return. And it's just, we see what a marvelous testimony it is of how God has his heart for all his people. And all he's, he's desiring that they would come back to this place of oneness and unity in him. We see as it goes on and describes a little more of this uh, Passover at the end of verse chapter 30 and verse 26. And so there was great joy in Jerusalem because there was nothing like this in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon and the son of David, king of Israel. And the Levites and the priests arose and blessed the people and their voice was heard and their prayers came to his holy dwelling place to heaven. Their prayers, that sacrifice, that incense of praise ascended to the very presence of the Lord in heaven there. Oh, what a, what a glory it was. It was just, it, it went above in all that could happen. It's wonderful how all that we could ever do, how what God, when he had hearts for him, there was that worship and adoration set free. These were ones whose hearts were set. And this is what God had called them back to. And we see God's, and we, just that long-suffering love that he has for his people. And when his people respond, there is that sweet fragrance of, sapper, of sacrifice to him. And it begs the question in our lives, where is our heart? Is our heart for all of God's people? You know, when we gather at this table, do we see it as a testimony for all of God's people? Do we realize there's one loaf? It's one loaf. It's our heart for all of God's people. That one loaf and that one cup. Is it for all of God's people? Or is it just for the ones that gather with us? Is it just for the ones that maybe have similar vision? Is it just for the ones we know? It's like Hezekiah. He wasn't going to be content to celebrate the Passover just for those in Jerusalem, just for those in Judah. But he saw God's heart to restore all of his people. And when we see this table, this table is a testimony for all God's people, the provision that Christ has made. Christ has become, Christ is our Passover. And he has this desire. He died for each and every one of us. You know, when we pray for the recovery of God's people, recovery for that testimony of Jesus, you know, who are we praying? Are we really praying for those that are far off, regardless of their spiritual condition, regardless of what, they're, what they might be doing? Are we praying for the Lord to recover them, that the Lord would have that testimony unto himself? The more we see of this God's heart for his people, the more our hearts will be broken when we see the condition of his people. And it provokes us to prayer. It provokes us to adoration unto him. Now we know, it in, as we see in the scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, and in the end days, there are those that by his grace respond to him. You know, the remnant in the Old Testament and the overcomers in the New Testament. But they're, they're those that are, will respond and those that won't respond. But but those that respond, that remnant, the over, what is their heart? Their heart is still for all God's people. The heart of the remnant. And when Ezra came back, when he led that group, when they came back from out of Babylon into uh, Jerusalem, they built the altar to the God of Israel. It wasn't to the altar of the God who was there just in Jerusalem. But it wasn't just the altar of the God of the remnant. It was the altar of the God of all Israel. He was, they were as a testimony. Even for those that had chosen to stay back in captivity in Babylon, their heart was still for them. Brothers and sisters, there are many of our brothers and sisters today 
that are still in captivity. Their hearts can be many places. They, but is our heart for them? Is our heart that we, the Lord, could really come and do a mighty restoration work? He is God of all the people. Would we not be those we can somehow limit uh, who we're standing for if we're not careful? We can be though we can think that we can be those standing for those of a similar vision. No, we're those standing for Christ. This is the testimony of Jesus. And he's died for all his people. This is what Hezekiah saw. There was a visible testimony during the time of Hezekiah to the oneness and the unity of all God's people. And that is only achieved through the cross. As we as we pray that the Lord would really desire to accomplish this wonderful work of unity, he would bring us all back to that foot of the cross because that's where, that's where true unity, that's where true oneness, that's where true restoration. We talk about restoration, recovering. It's done through the cross, the working of the cross, laying down our ideas, laying down this and that, and allowing the Lord to come in in a wonderful way to set us free. And so would we... I've been praying the Lord would open my heart in a, in a fuller and greater way to this because I think it, it has a direct impact upon our prayers for God's testimony in this hour. Sometimes I think we pray for God's testimony in too small of an arena. He's desiring that all of his people would be recovered. He's desiring that there would be this coming to him and a marvelous testimony. Now, we know that some are not going to respond, but we're going to still keep praying for everyone to respond and that he can draw ones. We don't know who will respond and who won't. If you think about, in many ways, it was the, the foolishness of God sent those couriers out to Israel. Israel had rejected God. They had turned their back on him. They had no further use for him. And yet the foolishness of God sends these ones and invites them to the Passover. Would we be fools for Christ today in praying for ones who look like they've totally gone away, totally done, not interested at all, pursuing their own doctrines, theologies, or whatever it might be? We're still one in Christ and that's, who we're stand, that's what we're standing for. That's what this table testifies of. And would that really be touching us in a way that as we pray for the God to work in this hour, one of the marvelous things he would do would bring about that recovering of that testimony of the oneness of the body of Christ, not just the teaching of the body of Christ, not just the teaching of the church, but the experiential living practice of us being one in Christ and caring for one another. That's his great love. Purchase that for us. As we're studying Ephesians and we talk about the riches that we've been brought into, that's some of the riches we have. The riches of being brothers and sisters in this body of Christ. Many of them, uh, as we said, they can be different places going different ways. But what is our call? Our call is to stand for that oneness and to be those that are really standing for his heart and for his interest. So we see in this first part of King Hezekiah's life the marvelous thing that he, that he did of bringing about this wonderful recovery of the testimony, the, the wonderful restoration of the house of God and restoring of the Passover, and God was moving in a marvelous way. But then there comes the 14th year of his life, uh, and he faces two great challenges. And <clears throat> if you look in chapter 32, it starts, uh, of Second Chronicles, it, it talks about the 14th year of his life. And this first challenge he faces is where Judah is invaded by Assyria. If we look at chapter 32, verse 1. It says, in these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah, besieged the fortified cities, and thought to break into them for himself. But thank the Lord, as Hezekiah and Judah humbled themselves before the Lord, he delivers them from the hand of Assyria. We can look over in verse 20. 
But King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed about this and cried out to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed every mighty commander and officer in the camp of the king of Assyria. It's wonderful how, I love how mighty and powerful our Lord is. Assyria had this wonderful army. And it says, the Lord just sent an angel. One angel. It doesn't even say the angel. If it said the angel, we could think, well, that's Christ. He's all powerful. It just says an angel. But an angel empowered by God can conquer the things of this world. And we, brothers and sisters, have been brought into that place too. Praise God. So it was that invasion was the first thing. The second thing that happened during this year, he became ill, down in verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. Praise God. You know, we see Hezekiah, he became ill. He cries out to the Lord, the Lord heals him. What is Hezekiah's response here? Look at verse 25. It's so discouraging. <laughs> Sometimes you look at these kings, they're supposed to encourage us. Sometimes there's discouraging too. But 25, but Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. And therefore, he's going to suffer some judgment. Yeah. And it's just, it's sad here. You know. But what, what can we learn from these two incidents? Well, to, as you look at these two incidents, you realize this is where you need 2 Kings and Chronicles together. You know, 2 Kings deals more with the, the historical side, and 2 Chronicles leads more with the, the spiritual lessons. As If we look, think first about this invasion from Assyria. Now, when Hezekiah became king, one of the first things he did was stop paying tribute to the king of Assyria. Now, his father Ahaz, in order to be protected, from Assyria. He had paid Assyria, and this was a normal thing back then. This was a great revenue source for Assyria. It says, you pay us so much money and we'll leave you alone. And so they would. So Ahaz actually sent some of the gold from the house of God and everything. And when Hezekiah became king, he said, this isn't right. And he was in that good place. So he stopped, pray stopped paying this tribute to Assyria. Well, then in about the 14th year, Assyria said, well, it's time that we need to go collect something here. So this mighty army comes down. And they come into Judah, and they're coming into Jerusalem. And now by this time, Judah has seen how the northern kingdom has been taken away into captivity. You know, they, they said, well, these guys came, and they just took all they, they took that part. And here they're coming to us. And Hezekiah, uh, if I could use a modern term, he basically freaked out. When he saw this army coming, he freaked out. And he said, first he tried to pay. He said, okay, I'll pay you, Assyria. I'll, let me, let's get some gold from the house of God, and we'll get some of this silver and gold here. And he tried to pay Assyria, but he couldn't pay them enough, and they kept coming. So he, he tried everything he could. Let's build our walls higher. Let's protect our water. It was kind of like he was doing everything he could in his own power and his own might to protect himself from the king of Assyria. And he, he, but that king kept coming, and he saw it wasn't going to do anything. But finally, praise God, Hezekiah comes to his senses, and he humbles himself before the Lord. And the Lord brings a mighty deliverance. And so this is what we see in 2 Chronicles 32, 7, <clears throat> as Hezekiah has, has come to his senses here. Look at verse in 32, 7, as he's encouraging the people. He says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed. Because the king of Assyria, nor because of the multitude which is with them. For the one with us is greater than the one with him. Hezekiah came back to that place of dependence upon the Lord. Of recognizing that God was with him. And God would defend him. And God had a heart and desired this testimony to be there. He continues on in verse 8. He says, because with him is only the arm of the flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people relied upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Praise God, he finally came to his senses. Uh, it is sad, you know, that after this, though, as we said, he became very proud. Uh, we see the Lord in his mercy when Hezekiah was in that right place. And he and Isaiah were there before the Lord as they humbled himself before the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. And the Lord came in. 
and delivered, brought a great deliverance. You know, brothers and sisters, when we find ourselves in these times of crisis, you know, what is our response? You know, Hezekiah tried to do everything in his own power, and then he finally said, he finally came to his senses. You know, would we would come to our senses right away and really stand and allow the Lord to meet us uh, and deliver us from these this place? Now the second thing that we said within that went on within Hezekiah's life during that 14th year was that Isaiah the prophet went to Isaiah to Hezekiah and said, uh, "Get everything in order. You're going to die." And again, Hezekiah freaked out, and he goes to the Lord. You know, it, it sounds like you know, Chronicles is so um, it, it shows the spiritual side, but in, in Kings and Isaiah where the chapters are quoted also. If you look at Hezekiah's prayer, he says, Lord, what do you mean I'm going to die? Look at all I've done for you. Look at all. I, I, he's like, hey, Lord, look at, look at what I did for you. I deserve better than this. What do you mean I'm going to die? And he, he makes his argument, and he pleads with the Lord. And the Lord, uh, in his what, what is termed his permissive will, grants Hezekiah 15 more years of life. And this actually ends up being a pretty tragic 15 years. We'll touch on in a minute. But as we see, he, Hezekiah was in a place of he couldn't just surrender to the Lord. He wrestled with God. And God said, okay. And in this 15 years, we know that during this time, this is when his son Manasseh was born. And Manasseh was the most evil king <laughs> in all the history of Judah. He did more evil and led them further astray. He reigned for, it, Manasseh reigned like 55 years of evil. And he, he, it was just tragic uh, what had come about. And as we said, now Hezekiah was healed not because of God's perfect will, but because of his permissive will. Um, now, you know, when you think about this permissive will, what are we talking about here? You know, God never forces his way upon us. God presents us with a choice. When God came to Hezekiah and he said, and this, this illness was from the Lord, he said, Lord, Isaiah says, you're going to die. Get your house in order. If Hezekiah had a choice, he could say, okay, Lord, I yield to your, not my will, but thy will be done. But Hezekiah said, no, I want, I want this, I want that. So God didn't force him. And we see the tragedy that came out of it. There's a couple of other times in the scripture when we see God's permissive will. And they usually end up pretty bad. Uh, if you think of when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, and they were, they were, as they came out of Egypt, what was God's perfect will? God told them to go in and possess the land. But what did they say? What did the people say? If you read the first chapter of Deuteronomy, we're not going to look, take time to look at it, but if you look at the first chapter of Deuteronomy, the people said, no, Lord, let's, let's send some spies in. <laughs> now, the spies weren't God's plan. That wasn't his highest will. That was man. That was man's thought. God's will was... You, I want you to go in and possess this land, this land that I'm giving to you, and I'll be your, your provision there. But they said, no, we want, let's send the spies in. And we know the tragic story that because of the way the spies went in, they had to end up wandering around in the wilderness for those 40 years. And, and all of them you know, ended up dying. God never forces his will upon us. But as he puts things before us, as he sets these choices before us, would we come to that place of saying, not my will, but thy will be done? You know, Hezekiah, when he was in this place, he, he couldn't come to that place of saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Really, if, if Hezekiah had just gone ahead and died then, his, he would have ended good. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, Mac and I were talking a little bit before. Sometimes these kings can be discouraging because you see how the Lord uses them, but then once the Lord uses them, they become proud. <laughs> and they, all, they don't end up uh, strong as they were in parts of their life. And, 
Uh, it's a great warning for us and how we're trying to learn these lessons. But, you know, if Hezekiah had just yielded to the Lord at that point, you know, he, he would have gone on and had that ended up with a wonderful testimony. Oh, he, but he wanted to live on and enjoy his earthly powers, enjoy his place of prominence upon the earth and everything else. And it's, it's very tragic because what else also happened during that time was once Babylon, by this time Babylon had taken over from uh, Assyria, Babylon uh, heard about Hezekiah getting healed. And so they sent some emissaries to Hezekiah and they flattered him. And he fell right for, he fell for the praises of man. So he, they came in and they said, oh, it's so wonderful, you were so great, all you're doing. And they flattered him and, he's, and in the pride of his heart, he said, yeah, look at all he's done. And he showed them all of the treasures of the kingdom, showed them all the treasures of the house of God. And it, they didn't forget that. About 100 years later, they came back and took it all. You know, because they, they, it, was, it was brought by God's judgment there. But would we be those that really allow uh, the Lord to be teaching us in, the, in the, the days and times we're living in? Because we see here how you know, that, that pride of what he showed, what the pride of what Hezekiah showed the people from Babylon you know, ended up being used later on. And God brought a judgment there as he judged Israel for it. So if so often we have this little prayer, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And when we come to these times of crisis, when we come to the times of when the Lord is really trying to speak to us, would we really not trust in ourselves, not lean on our own ways? As we look at Hezekiah's life, we see how at the beginning, as he was really had he was in that place of first love where the Lord would have preeminence. He didn't care about the condition of the temple. He went in and he fully restored it. He didn't care about the people of the northern kingdom not having a heart for the Lord. He had that heart and he knew God did. And he went ahead and moved uh, and sent those emissaries there. He was one, he had a wonderful heart for the Lord in his house. Oh, wh what an encouragement that is to us. And how he cleansed out all those idols. Even the so-called, we could call them Christian idols. And would we, if they have anything like that within our hearts. But sadly, you know, how, how he ends up. I, would just, I was reminded of what it says of Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. In Moses, it's a wonderful testimony. It says, Moses did not consider the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure. Motor, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of this world. And Hezekiah, he didn't consider that reproach of Christ as greater. The treasures of the world captured his heart. In the days we're living in, brothers and sisters, are we willing, has the Lord captured our hearts in such a way, that those reproaches of Christ, the sufferings of Christ, not become offensive to us, and that our hearts not be attracted by the things of this world and the things out there. You know, we see... Once we, this is one of the beauties of studying this book of Ephesians. It's because that in that, we, we were talking about it a little bit Friday night, all of the riches there, all, over and over there, these surpassing riches and how he's lavished them on us. And if we can, if the Lord can give us just a small glimpse of all the riches we have in Christ, the treasures of this world fade away. And those reproaches of Christ, we find ourselves embracing them as Moses embraced them. And that when we're faced with some tough choices of life, when we're faced with these crises that are set before us, Hezekiah, the Lord said, you're going to die. There's other crises that we all face. But would we come to that place of saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Let's not be those that are settling for God's permissive will. It only delays his return. It delayed the people of Israel from going into their promised land by 40 years. If we continue to choose that permissive will, God will let, he lets us go our own ways, but he brings us back to that point of saying, you need to make a choice. 
And we need to say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. If we can come to the, the Lord, allow the Lord to be training us in such a way to be a people that are, have a heart for all of God's people, a heart for God's testimony in this day and time, these are the ones that God can use in these days of declension to bring about recovery, to bring about a hastening. Would we not be too narrow, but would we be those that are standing for the fullness of all that he has? And would we be those that are willing to endure the reproaches of Christ? And having a hard attitude, Lord, we don't desire our own will. Lord, I might not understand your will. I might not understand your ways. But Lord, I definitely don't want my will done. I want your will done. Because I know your will is good, it's perfect, and acceptable. Praise God, doing his will isn't based upon how much of his will we understand. It's based upon simply a heart responding and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us into the fullness of what his will has for us. So may we be that people in this hour that we're living in. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that we have these ones that we can be instructed by. Lord, we're thankful at the beginning of Hezekiah's life, his standard was you. And Lord, we want you to be our standard. And Lord, where we have any other standards, either in our individual life, in our life together, any standard other than Christ, would you shake and would you shatter it? Lord, we don't want to seek after those other things. But we want to have those hearts that are seeking after you and allowing you to, to use us in this hour. We don't want to waste these times. We don't want to delay your return. We don't want to be found working against you. But we want to be those that are truly willing to lay down our will, that your will could be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.